All right. Welcome, everyone. Good to see a full house tonight. Good to see those that are jumping on Facebook Live. We welcome everyone. Glad you're here, not only in the congregation, but on social media tonight. We are going to talk tonight about something that I believe is very, very pertinent to each and every one of us. How many know that if there's not a practicality to the truth, if we can't make it simple, if we can't make it practical, then it's just a bunch of information. So this is number five tonight of reimagining omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. And we're going to talk about the dynamics a full participation. Now that's the key word. I want to show you something tonight about full participation. You know, sometimes we think we're participating just because we have a few revelations. Maybe because we know that the kingdom of God is within us. Or because we know I am health, I am wealth, I am all things of the kingdom. And we know that, at least in the head, right? But I want to show you tonight what real, true participation is by the Spirit and from the truth that is written upon our heart and upon our mind. Now, last week we asked and answered eight different questions. I want to breeze through these real quickly tonight just to kind of reestablish it within your heart and within your awareness. And the first question we asked is, why pray? Why pray if God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient? Well, if he is those three omnis, then that means he's in control. He controls everything. And it's not contingent upon anything we do or do not do. So why pray? Besides the fact that the scripture tells us to pray. And we talked about seven or eight different types of prayer last Sunday. And I showed you how they come under four headings. And the main heading is just simply us acknowledging that which is already true about us. But what does it really mean to acknowledge? And we're going to talk about that as we talk about full participation. And some people say that, well, I don't spend any time in prayer because... You know, God is sovereign and he's in control and no matter what I decide to do or not do, it's going to all pan out. Well, not really. Because we're finding out that God cannot single-handedly, and that's the key word, do anything concerning the appearance of evil, concerning wars, concerning starvation in the world. But he's looking for a people that will participate with him and then he does it through us. I brought out the fact last week that Jesus himself said, miracles don't make you believe. So therefore, if our father could do something single-handedly about evil and war and starvation, what would that do for us? We'd just be lazy. Well, God's in control and he's sovereign and he's just going to do it all. And we would have no part in it whatsoever. So that would not do a whole lot for us, would it? Second question was, if God is uncontrolling, how do we explain miracles? Well, Jesus said it this way, with God all things are possible. Now, the word with is the key word there. In agreement with, in participation with. And I shared with you that a lot of people are asking God to intervene divinely. Can I tell you? He can't. To intervene means to come between. God is not going to come between us and evil or us and anything that is not of the kingdom of God until we agree with it and until we participate. Intervene means to come between and come into. And God does not single-handedly come between people and situations. He does not single-handedly cause a miracle to happen over here or over there. We're the ones that bring about the manifestation of the miracles or the signs or the wonders. God cannot single-handedly do those things. 
But we have a whole religious system out here that asks God for stuff consistently. What does it mean to ask God for stuff? It means that you have a duality and you have a sense of separation where you and the Father are concerned. Because if he has already made you that, you are health, you are wealth, you are all things of the kingdom, then why are you asking the Father for stuff in your life that he can't bring anyhow? This makes so much sense. I cannot tell you how many people have sent me comments since I have started this series. You've answered a ton of questions. This is why we have atheists, because, well, bless God, if he's omnipresent, if he's omniscient, if he's omnipotent, then why isn't he stopping all this crap out here? Well, why do I need a God in my life then? And that's the attitude they take. And so they say, well, I'll just become an atheist. I'll just not believe in a God whatsoever. Third question was, what does an uncontrolling God do? If he's not out here sovereignly controlling things and making sure everything turns out right, what is he doing? He's upholding. He's sustaining. He's maintaining his kingdom within us. And remember, I told you that Father cannot, when there's a shooter on the loose, God cannot throw up a wall between the shooter and the ones he's aiming at. Why? He doesn't have a body. He doesn't have a localized body. He's incorporeal. We're his body. We can stop it if we happen to be there and things happen in a certain way. Many, many people have stopped shooters from killing a bunch of people. So therefore, Jesus in his life and ministry was the body of the Father, and now he has ascended. Now we are the body of the Father. So he does things through our body. He's given the earth to the children of men, the scripture says. And this is why all creation is on tiptoe looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. Whether they realize it or not, they're really looking to a people to make things right through the power of the spirit within them, through the grace of God. And through trusting in the finished work, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now, let me back up on that a little bit. What did Jesus do in his death, burial, resurrection? Well, his death exposed the lies we embraced. And his resurrection brought a reversal right here. Sure did. And it means the discovery of spiritual truth. In other words, we forgot who we were because religion lied to us. And so therefore, Jesus laid down his life to expose the lies. The veil was rent right here, not just in the temple physically, but right here the veil was rent so that we could then begin to see properly and through his resurrection then, we began to have the truth revealed unto us. Next question we asked, what does it mean to say God loves everyone and everything? Well, love is his primary motif. It's not his power, it's his love. And his main priority is to be led by love and then power will fall in place naturally. And I shared with you three phases of love. The first one was intentional action. In other words, he intentionally loved us first. Number two was response because he loved us first. We love him and it was all for our well-being. So when we love people, it's for their well-being. When he loves us, it's for our well-being. In other words, what do I mean? Love is uncontrolling. Love is not going to sovereignly control things that he's given you the ability to control or to do. So love in this sense is for the well-being of everyone. Now let me go back to what I said. Jesus said people do not believe when they see a miracle. So in other words, if God was out here performing sovereignly all of these miracles, signs and wonders single-handedly doing those things, it would not be for our well-being. It wouldn't help us, because miracles don't cause you to believe. We'd get lazy. lazy. we think, well, you know, what's the purpose? We wouldn't have any purpose. We wouldn't have any vision. Well-being would not be worked into our life because of his love. We also ask the question, how does Jesus Christ fit into the theology of uncontrolling love? Well, He helps us understand what this love means. How did he do that? 
How was he involved in this theology of the uncontrolling love? He came to reveal the love of the Father. Yes. Everything he did in his life, in his ministry, was to reveal the Father. And then in Philippians, where it says he humbled himself, he emptied himself, it's the Greek word kenosis that means self-giving and others empowering. So in other words, Jesus demonstrated the uncontrolling love in his miracles and in his passion at the cross, and he revealed the Father as self-giving and others empowering, and therefore, therefore, as uncontrolling love, in that he doesn't control stuff, but he's given us the ability through his power and his ability to control stuff. Next question was, number six was, if God created the universe, and he's their creator, why, right? If he created the universe, then why can't he stop evil? Well, remember, to answer that question, I posed another question. Did God create the universe single-handedly? Or did he confer with others? Wasn't Holy Spirit there? Wasn't Christ Jesus there? Weren't we there? So therefore, I believe, see, I believe we chose to come here. I believe he did it in concert and in participation with Holy Spirit, with Christ Jesus, and with us. And I hope to do a whole message on that because that's some mind-blowing stuff because we think God just slung the universe into existence single-handedly. Next question, the seventh question was, what hope do you and I have if his love is uncontrolling? Much more hope. <laughs> Because we have to get involved. Say that again. What hope do we have if God's love is uncontrolling, if it's not manipulative, if it's not coercing? What hope do we have? Way more hope because we have to get involved. We're the ones that are involved because it's now being done through what is being done is being done through a many-member man, a many-member Christ. Last question was, do we really know and we're coming to know this, but do we really know that God cannot prevent or stop evil single-handedly? Most people don't. You know why? They're waiting on a man to split the eastern sky, come back on a white horse, and set everything straight, rapture some people out of here, and set everything straight, and then they're going to go through a seven-year tribulation, and all of these horrible things are going to happen upon the earth, and then he's going to come back, and we're going to come back with him, and everything is going to be made right. Well, three Greek words, at least, and I know there's some others, three Greek words for coming and appearing are epiphania, his outraying, his outshining, his parousia, yes. which is his presence, we are his presence, yes. and his apocalypsis, which means we are being unveiled as to who we are in the earth today. Right. Yes. And all of those words refer to his coming in and as a people. Right. Now, what I want to share tonight, as I said, do we understand the dynamics of full participation? We need to know. And what is full participation? As I said, if we cannot put the truth into practice, it's just merely information. So I want to see how you and I can participate with our whole being. When I say whole being, I mean our whole being. You know, Scripture says, uh, you know, someone came to him and asked him about the commandments. He said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your strength. That's the whole being, folks. So if we're going to be participators, and we are, we're going to learn how to participate wholly and completely. We're going to learn to engage our divine imagination. Now, Paul the Apostle talked about vain imaginations, right? He said you need to cast those down. But we need to understand that in our feminine principle, we have a divine imagination. And, it's in, and we've talked a lot. We did three and a half years on mind-brain connection. We talked a lot about yielding intellect, reason, and logic, and feelings, and five senses to our Christ's mind. But we have a faculty in our feminine principle that is called the divine imagination. Now, if I would have brought my chart tonight, I have a chart of the tabernacle and all the pieces of the furniture. It's an old chart. I've had it for 30 years, probably. 
And the one piece of furniture that was in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And remember the two cherubims on either end of the Ark of the Covenant? There were two, representing masculine and feminine becoming one. They mean apprehended ones, and we've been apprehended for this high calling of the Father. But the two cherubim also means divine imaginaries. Divine imaginaries or your divine imagination. In Psalm 103, verse 14, it says there that he knoweth our frame. The word frame there means imagination. It is used, frame is used as divine imagination five times in the Old Testament. Genesis 6, 5, Genesis 8, 21, Deuteronomy 31, 21, 1 Chronicles 28, 9, 1 Chronicles 29, 18, and this divine imagination, the word frame is the divine imagination. This divine imagination is the dynamo, if I can say it that way, or the power source of your life. For out of it flows, this is why the scripture says, guard your heart, slash awareness. For out of it flows, listen, out of it flows the issues of life. So we need to guard that truth that we know, allow it to be conceived and quickened within our heart awareness, protect it, protect it, because it is the life force or life source or dynamo of our life. And it is where the issues of life will flow forth from. As a man thinks in his heart slash awareness, so is he, or so is his experience. Now, a lot of people, when you talk about imagination, they relegate that to childhood fantasy. Yeah. I remember some of the fantasy that came out of my life when I was a kid. I'm not going to go into it, but I could tell you a lot of fantasies that I had. Where did that come from? My imagination. And people relegate, oh, when you talk about divine imagination, oh, that's just for kids. Well, listen, we have lost, we need to go back to a childlike state if you will, and we need to resurrect our divine imagination once again. But people try to underestimate its influence and try to receive from God without ever activating their divine imagination. Let me give you another scripture. In Genesis, you're all familiar with this, Genesis 11, 5 and 6, God told the people, even though they were in Babylon, which means confusion by mixture, he still told them that nothing would be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Why? Because the imagination is like a spiritual womb. It's our dynamo, life force, it's our creative center. But now listen, even in the natural, they were in Babylon, there was a lot of confusion going on, and he even told them, that you would be able, you would not be restrained from what you have imagined to do. In other words, what you imagine to do, even if it's carnal, it's going to have some benefit. That's what I hear in that. Even if it's carnal, even if, if it's just positive thinking, even if it's just mind over matter, it's going to bring forth some benefit, but it's going to be limited. And we know what happened here in Genesis chapter 11. The languages were confused and they had to let off, you know, the building, the tower, trying to get to heaven through works, because you can't. But even their carnal way of thinking, he told them that nothing would be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And there's a lot of people in religion today that have gone quite far in religiosity and have built kingdoms built kingdoms for themselves, yeah. amassed a whole lot, millions of dollars by the carnal books that they have written and sold, but left behind books have made millions upon millions of dollars, and it, nothing is further from the truth in many of those books. So in other words, they have not been restrained in what they imagined to do, and they have done it. But listen, folks, it is not going to stand. It's a house divided against yeah. itself. It will not be fruit that remains. It will not be profitable in the long run. Now, listen to this. The title tonight, the subtitle of this message, is Reimagining, of course, 
omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, but the, the subtitle is reimagining or it is the dynamics of our participation. And so I'm going to go back to the first title, reimagining. Re means over and over, consistently doing something over and over and over. So as we reimagine in our divine imagination, what are we doing? We are mulling over and over, re, again and again and again. We are putting this truth in our divine imagination. We are on purpose yes. reminding ourselves of the truth yes. that has always been the truth Come about us. Yeah, we yeah, just yeah. forgot it and it had to be, we had to be re reminded right. once again. But millions of people today in religion pray to God for stuff to be given to them over and over and over to no, uh, no avail. Sheila was asking me tonight, what about babies that are born with mental ailments and are crippled and so forth? What about the genetic mutations that take place? Well, we're going to talk about that. Because I've had a lot of people, not recently, but I've had a lot of people ask me, what about children? Do you notice what Jesus did when the man was born blind? The religious people came and said, well, was it his mother and father that sinned or was it him? What did he do? He totally redirected their attention to the glory of God. Yes, he did. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. So we may talk about that because I know that that is, that is a... a you know, question that people have on their minds when we're talking about what we're talking. But what I told her, I said, if God is single-handedly omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, there wouldn't be any babies born like that. Because he wouldn't want that, and he'd be single-handedly taking care of that before it ever happened. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, we must deliberately, on purpose, decide to incorporate our divine imagination. We have the power of the Spirit to do that. And we do that through meditation. We can do that through contemplation. We can do that, as I said, reimagine as we continually mull over the truth, continually remind ourselves of the truth. Not only when we're in a trial or got a diagnosis or don't have enough money in the bank to pay our bills for that month. Not only then, but listen, be on top of it by always doing it. Don't wait till you have a problem. Right. Let it be your lifestyle. Right. And then when those things crop up, it's like hitting a brick wall. Now, let's answer the question, what is the meaning of the word imagination? It is the ability to form mental images. Can you see how you are involved in that? Imagination is the ability that you have received from the Father to form these mental images. A person called an imagist is a poet who expresses feelings, important word, and thoughts in graphic images. And the word imaginative means, listen, to conceive by the imagination. Other words synonymous that we could use for imagination or divine imagination are consciousness, See how closely related they are to what we talk about all the time around here? Consciousness, awareness, divine imagination, of course, perception, realization. These are synonyms of divine imagination. To put on the Christ mind, to put the Christ mind on in our heart awareness, where it can be conceived and quickened. And also, I'm going to use a different word here, also the divine matrix. I see it as the imaginal realm in that it even involves our feelings. I'm going to develop that a little bit. You've heard people talk about the, well, we'll talk about that later. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But anyhow, I see this exercised when it says that Jesus had compassion on the people. I see it exercised in Jesus and his divine imagination when it came time to raise Lazarus, and it says that Jesus wept. 
Not because he was sad because his close friend Lazarus had died, but because he was feeling the feel of how it would be when Lazarus was raised to life. In other words, it's the feelings which are filtered through our Christ mind as we see it done and how that would feel. Now let me have you go to a scripture in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Matthew 18, 19 and 20. And when we know that we have moved from the realm of faith, how many know we have the faith of the Son of God, and we operate in the realm of faith, but how many know we can move beyond that into knowing When we've exercised the faith, we then move into knowing to where we know that we know that we know. No one can talk us out of it. But when we move from faith to knowing is when we actually get into the realm of the feelings of seeing something that is already done. Now, that's true participation, folks. When you yield the feelings and the emotions, the five senses, the intellect, the reason, the logic to your Christ mind, then you can, out of that compassion and out of the realm where Jesus wept concerning Lazarus because he saw him, he felt the feel of what it's going to be like to talk to the guy again and to be with him again. So notice what it says here. What are we talking about? We're talking about dynamics of full. Not just a thought now and then. Not just acknowledging, I am health, I am wealth, I am all things of the kingdom now and then. I am talking about full participation, like loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your strength, and your might. Right? I'm talking about full participation. So look what it says here in Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven, verse 20, for where two, now I'm glad he added three, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, we have often thought that meant if I get Julie here and I have something that I want to agree for, she agrees with me, and maybe we'll add another person, we'll add Jody to it, to the mix, And we'll pray for this certain thing to happen if there's at least two or three of us. But let me give another idea of that, which is true participation. It's where two or three agree in you as touching a thing. Listen. And the two are the Christ mind and the heart awareness. And the third is the feeling yielded to the Christ mind and exercising that feeling as you are seeing it already accomplished and done. I believe this is what took place with the woman that said, that had the issue of blood, and said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made whole. I believe there were three realms that were responding within her. She was feeling the feel. Do you think she just came and said, well, if I can just touch a hem of his garment, I know I'll be whole. <laughs> I think she was excited. I think she was jumping up and down. I think she was feeling the feel. I won't have to go to the doctors anymore and give them all my money and only get worse instead of better. I'm going to yield to the Christ mind within me, see what the Christ mind will say about my issue of blood. And then I'm going to bring it to my feminine principle and not be led by intellect, reason, or logic. And then I'm going to take my feelings and my emotions about all of this and I'm going to yield it to my Christ mind and I'm going to hear what Christ says about it and I'm going to feel the feel of it being already done. Feel it. Come on. Feeling it. For example, the new science tells us today that there is an energy field that extends out from our heart at least six to eight feet. And listen, your heart is a part of your being that can feel. I'm not talking about lower emotions or feelings. I'm talking about them being yielded to the Christ mind. But scientifically, 
If you've ever heard of Heart Math Institute, I have a friend in Illinois, I think Rockford, Illinois, that is a professor at the Heart Math Institute. And they teach heart coherence there. And so what they say is that they can do tests that determine how much heart coherence you actually have. For example, they could have gone to Peter when his shadow, his aura, his vibrational Christ mind was reaching out six to eight feet. They could have tested him and they could have seen that that was what when the people came in contact within six and eight feet of his shadow, his aura, his vibrational frequency of his Christ mind, they were instantly healed and made whole. In other words, they could have seen how far his shadow actually reached out from him, his body, to heal the people, from his mind and his body to heal the people. Now, when we utilize the energy field or move, as I said, from faith into knowing, we can speak the language of the energy field through our Christ mind, join with our heart awareness, incorporating our feeling of how it would feel when it is done, and we can experience what man calls impossible. Now, what are we talking about? Fully participating. We're talking about ampanence, ampresence, omniscience. That's what we're talking about. Now, I remember years ago, and some of you were not here, but I remember many years ago, can't remember the series I was talking about or teaching at the time, but I shared with you how that there is a video, and I think it's still up. Greg Braden is the guy who put it up. And you can, you can type in or Google medicineless hospital. And what you will see is three Chinese doctors, yes. looking kind of ridiculous, actually. Yeah. But they're standing there, these three doctors, and they had this specialized x-ray, and you can see this happen. They are praying over this woman that had bladder cancer. She had tumors within her urinary bladder. So they were praying over her, and they were saying in Chinese, it is done, it is done, it is done. And then all of a sudden, they started jumping up and down and laughing because they were incorporating the feel of how they would feel and how she would feel once she was made whole from that bladder cancer. And you can see it. You can see the x-ray. You can see within two minutes and 40 seconds, you can see those tumors dissolve. And I remember when I saw that video, I immediately related it to the woman with the issue of blood and how she said within herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. And you know, in Mind Brain Connection, we talked about the hippocampus, which has to do with remembering. And another word for hippocampus is, is, is the hem. In other words, I think that something took place within her hippocampus that she remembered that she was never made and brought here to be sick and have an issue of blood. It did something within her hippocampus. Now, a very interesting thing about these three doctors that looked ridiculous, Greg Braden also said that they did not judge according to good and evil, yes. concerning this woman's tumors. Yes. They had no judgment. no judgment. Which reminds me of the book that we wrote on living out of your spiritual resources. And when I taught that, the main text was Isaiah chapter 40 and 50. Isaiah 40 and 50 chapters. And I shared within there that Isaiah was talking about the nations or imaginations that can allegorically mean vain imaginations. And it was saying there that when you see something in the realm of appearance like an appearance of evil, it is a no thing. Now, people who are suffering, it's a thing to them. When you're in pain, it's a thing. But if we can go beyond the pain or beyond the appearance of evil, if we can, and this is what we have to do with the whole earth as we participate with Father. We must see the whole earth full of the glory of God and not look at the chaos because it is nothing. It has no God substance. It is not true substance. It is not real as God calls real. It is a no thing. And I remember recalling that after I saw this video on YouTube, I found 
in a place. I don't even remember. It's been so long ago. I don't even remember where I found this. But I found a place where the word be, listen to this, be as in be healed, means to feel the feeling of it as already done. Be healed. Be whole. To feel the feeling of it as though it's already done. And the Greek meaning, listen, for feeling is to be touched with the feeling of or out from. The Greek for feeling means to be touched with a feeling of or out from. Now listen, folks, divine imagination can, as I've already stated, be likened to our right-sided, a right-sided matrix. You can have the matrix of the world, judged by intellect, yep. reason, logic, feelings, five senses, and so forth. And most people today, including religious people, live by the matrix of the left side, how it looks, how it feels, right. what the doctor says, what the diagnosis says, what the bank says, and all that sort of thing. But there is a matrix, which means a womb, also of the right side. And we can live out of the matrix of the womb of our Christ mind and our heart awareness. Now listen to this. The free dictionary defines it, the matrix, right-sided matrix, as the cavity or the mold in which anything is formed. Right? In fact, we know Paul said in Galatians 4, around verse 19, I travail again until Christ be formed in you. And it states metaphorically that this is the place, this divine right-sided matrix is the place where things are formed for you to give birth to. So when we talk, and we talk about this a lot around here, when we talk about the divine feminine or the feminine principle and the divine masculine, what are we talking about? We're talking about taking the truth and depositing it into our divine feminine and allowing our imagination to continually re, over and over, re again and again that divine imagination. It's something we do, folks. I heard someone say the other day on Facebook, that I'm believing God to renew my mind. I thought, well, you're going to be waiting a long time because God ain't going to re renew your mind. Paul said, you slip into the Christ mind. You do it. You can wait eons and eons, and he is not going to automatically renew your mind. Now, let me give you a vivid example of the Christ mind and the heart awareness including the divine imagination, along with the feelings from it is done. And I heard of this story years ago, and I know I brought it to you years ago again. There was this man that was called by another individual to go out and pray with him concerning a drought that they were having. Any of you remember the story? And, and the two men went out into a place to pray together, and this is what they did because they both had this understanding, they both quietly felt as though it was raining. Mm -hmm. The feeling of it is done, right? They on purpose smelled the rain. You know how it smells when it's going to rain or when it does rain? And they on purpose felt mud between their toes. Mm -hmm. Now, guess what the outcome was? <laughs> it rained. So what were they doing? These men were simply yielding anything in the left side that tried to say famine or tried to say drought yes. or tried to say no rain. Hasn't rained for ages. It ain't going to rain. Who do you think you are that you can do this? But they participated so deeply with their Christ mind, their feminine principle, and with their divine imagination, allowing the feeling of it is done to be felt within them and it wasn't long, and it rained. In fact, it rained so much they had to pray for it to stop. Now, notice they didn't say, Oh, thou omnipresent Father, Kanda Shanda Shanda. How was that? Oh, omniscient God, you know all things. Oh, omnipresent Father, you have all power to cause it to rain. No, they felt. They yielded. 
the left side. They yielded anything that told them otherwise of what God's will and God's plan was concerning the drought. Now, Colossians 3.12 says this. It says for us, well, let me just read it. Colossians 3.12. You, you can turn there if you want to turn there. Colossians 3.12 talks about bowels of mercies. And let me read it. It says, put on or slip into. You do this. Not God's going to do it for you. You may be inspired by spirit within you, by Father, yes. But you put on, I'm adding a few words to make it easier to understand. Put on, you slip into, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, slip into bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. Yield your intellect, in other words. Yield your reason, your logic, and put on the bowels of mercy. Now, I want to connect the feelings, the feeling of it is done. I mean, we probably do a whole lot of weird things if we were believing for something and we incorporated this feeling to feel that it's done. We may do a whole lot of strange things just like these three Chinese doctors did. I mean, it looked ridiculous, but they knew what they were doing. They were rejoicing and jumping up and down like little kids, like kids do yeah. on Christmas morning, yeah. right? Yeah. Jumping up and down. Oh, I'm going to get a bicycle. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. <laughs> so the Greek meaning of compassion, listen to this, means, because compassion is feeling, right? It means to be moved, to have the bowels yearn. It means inner affection. It means to be strengthened from the spleen, which is part of the intestines. Yes. Now, let me add this to that. There are three, actually three parts yep. in this area of your body that have to do with the energy fields and the solar plexus. Right. You have the root yep. energy field, mm -hmm. you have the sacral energy field, and you have the solar plexus. Yeah. And they all have to do with feeling, talking about compassion, talking about feeling the feel of it is done. Then in your head, you have two that have to do with feeling as well. So in other words, when Jesus was moved with compassion, his whole being was involved. His whole being was involved. And also, the heart is defined, listen, if you look up in Strong's, the heart means the seat of emotion. And listen, we can do this because in the classic Amplified, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says we are sanctified, and I add some words, we are spiritified, and we are deified objectively through and through. So we can incorporate every part of our spirit, our soul, and our body. In believing, not something that's going to become true about us, but in believing and knowing that which is already done and already accomplished. Not just as a result of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, but even before. How many know Jesus healed and raised the dead even before his death, burial, and resurrection? It's just that we forgot because of religiosity, and he rent the veil, and he reminded us of who we were from before time ever began. So, in other words, when truth is conceived and when it is quickened in our heart awareness from our Christ mind, our whole being can get involved and experience the feelings of joy as though it's already accomplished and it's already done. Because why? Because it is already done objectively all oh, there's nothing this is why father can't do anything that is already done that's one of the reasons that you don't see father doing anything and people by the groves are asking him to heal and stop this and stop the other he can't because he can't do what he's already done so therefore instead of us focusing upon the evil in the world and the wars in the world and the starvation, and of course, we hate to see that. Certainly we do hate to see that. And we have compassion for those people. But we still need to see the whole earth full of the glory instead of focusing upon the chaos that we see out there that is happening. 
And that is when we are truly, listen, when we have our whole being involved in seeing the whole earth full of the glory of God, just as our whole earth is full of the glory of God, then we are participating and we're going to experience the impotence, omniscience, the impotence <coughs> of the Father working through us. And see, folks, God gave us feelings and emotions. We're not trying to, I hear people say, you've got to crucify the flesh. Well, no, it's already crucified. All we have to do is just simply yield it. No crucifying. That's already done and accomplished. He gave us emotions for a reason. He gave us intellect. What kind of a zombie would we be if we didn't have intellect? What kind of an imbecile would we be if we didn't have feelings? He gave us those for a reason, but he also gave them to us to learn to yield unto him and fully participate with him. Now, I also, when I saw this Greg Braden video of the Medicineless Hospital, I also was directed to another video that he was talking about. And in this video, he was stating that Princeton University has developed an instrument that can measure the level of consciousness of the whole country. And what he was saying in this was right before 9-11, the consciousness of the country was very, very low. Very, very low. And I'll just encourage you today. If you're one that spends a lot of time watching the news media, then if they would measure your consciousness it would be on a very low level. And you would not be in participation through the power of God to right the wrongs that are out there and to help the situations in the world. I mean, listen, if we could imagine, if we could simply imagine and participate and see this thing as done and have a little joy about that, we could see some changes. Now, not changes in the sense that let me say it this way. Nothing is going to change because nothing is out of order in the kingdom of God. But it's going to appear like some changes because there does need to be some changes in the appearance realm. And the changes, like Jesus said, what did he come? He, he came to seek and to save that right here, which was lost. We don't have war because people enjoy having war. We have war today because of people's religion and their greed. It's all man-centered. Yes. And since, man, since it's all man-centered, man has to be the one to stop it. Right. Now, let me go one more place, and I'm going to close. Let's go to 2 Kings. I want to give you an example. 2 Kings chapter 4. And you all know this story. But we are called to subjectively join. How many know where the scripture says, Matthew 18, whatsoever things you bind, whatsoever things you, let me stop and preface that, whatsoever things you bind on earth, are already bound in heaven, the Amplified says. Whatsoever you loose is already loosed in heaven. What is that saying? That is saying that objectively heaven and earth are already one, but we now go forth and we subjectively join heaven and earth. It means to tie together. To tie together. To bind is to tie together. To loose is to what? It's to loose what needs to be loosed. And we are doing that through our participation. We're loosing things that need to be loosed in the earth. But listen, again, whatsoever things you. Don't say God's going to do it. Whatsoever thing God binds on earth or bound in heaven, whatsoever he looses or loops in heaven. I didn't say that. Whatsoever things you. It's a many member Christ, folks. Now, 2 Kings. Look what it says. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. And this is the story of this little widow woman that had all these creditors that had come because her husband died, leaving her with huge debt. And they had come to take her two sons away to pay for the debt. So look what it says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. There cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. Her husband feared the Lord. And the creditor is come to... To, to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. And Elisha said unto her, What do you want? What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? Well, I'm going to tell you tonight, you have a lot in your house. 
You have a lot in your house. You have the answer in your house. Oh, come on. Okay? And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. Well, that's how religion believes. I ain't got nothing in my house. Yeah, yeah. I got poverty. I got sickness. I got this. I got kids that are horrible. Oh. Right? Instead of seeing them through the glory of God. And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. Save a pot of oil. That's all I got, a little pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Get as many as you can get, in other words. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee, and upon thy son. You've got to shut the door to intellect, reason, and logic, and feelings, and five senses in and of themselves. And you've got to yield them all to the Christ mind. And thou shalt pour out into all these vessels, that little flask of oil that you have. Begin to pour it into all of these vessels, maybe just a drop per vessel, I don't know. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So when she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, they begin to pour out. Verse 6, And it came to pass when the vessels were full that, oh, wait a minute, they were full. I thought she only had a little flask with a little oil. It came to pass when the vessels were full, something supernatural happened here. There was a divine intervention. There wasn't some God omniscient out here doing this. It was her listening to what the prophet Elisha said and doing it. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. He said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Verse 7. Then she came and told the man of God, Elisha, and he said, Take their oil now and go sell it and pay your debt and you'll have enough money for you and your, your two sons to live from eons to eon forever. So in other words... This woman believed the word of the prophet Elisha, and she simply participated. And notice she didn't say, Oh, thou mightiest heavenly Father, omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful God, all-knowing Father, you know I need some debt cancellation here. Your jubilee. Huh? Oh, she didn't say that whatsoever. Would you uh, please add some super to my natural father? You're omnipotent. You're omniscient. You're all-powerful. You're all-knowing. You're every uh, where present. No, she just simply participated with what Elisha said. Oh, man. She participated, and the apparent need, which wasn't a need at all, the apparent need was met. She didn't ask father for anything. She simply believed and participated. And she sold the oil, had enough to pay off the debt, and had enough for her and her sons to live the rest of their lives. Now the same thing is true with the the three Hebrew boys. They came out smelling like a rose instead of like smoke. (laughs) Why? They participated. (laughs) They saw their whole earth full of the glory of God without the smell of smoke or clothes singed or hair singed or all of that. They saw them, their whole earth full of the glory of God. What about Gideon and the Midianites? Here you have an army of 135,000 people coming against 32,000 in Judges chapter 6 through 8. And then on top of all of that, God tells Gideon, Go get your 32,000 men, take them down to the river, and have them start drinking water. And some of them drank water by putting their head in the water, right? And slurping, and they couldn't look up. They'd be blind for sure. And then some others, 300, used their hands and brought it up watching. And then they were told, then they were told, Gideon was told to do three things. They had candles in in these little uh, jars, candles in the jars. And he said, when I tell you I want you to smash those jars, I want you to blow your trumpets, and I want you to begin shouting. And it scared the enemy so terribly bad, they turned on each other and killed one another. (laughs) Now look what they did. They simply participated. Gideon simply participated and did what he was told to do. Now, that was 
Spirit of God in him told him to do what he did. He obeyed, he participated, he told his army to obey and participate as well. And they had a great victory that day. So, yes, what we do, we do through the power of God. Not eliminating that, but you are his omniscience. And when you need to know something, Spirit of God is right there letting you know. You are his omnipresence. He doesn't dwell in temples made with man's hands. There's no God in this place. When we're gone, we bring the presence of the Lord here. Right? Right? See, if you can find one place in the scripture where it shows that he's not omnipresent or everywhere present at one time, well, then you've got a case. He doesn't dwell in temples made with man's hands. You're his omnipresence. You're his power, his omnipotence. You're his all-knowingness. And we found out through Jeremiah how that there are some things. And again, if you can just find one place, there are some things the Father doesn't know about us. He told Jeremiah, I know my plans that I have for you. They're for good and not evil. It doesn't even come to my mind. Because as I said, if God knew anything bad about us happening, where energy focus goes, energy flows, I guarantee you it would happen. Because God's known it about you. It would happen. So the thing is, we need to know the things that God knows about us, which is, you know, if you study the Hebraic language, you will find it's all positive. Nothing is negative in the Hebraic language. That's right. yep. And listen, the same way with our Father. There are things, people say, well, someone wrote me a comment and said, well, God can do anything. No, he can't. I beg to differ with you. He can do anything. You can do anything through his power by participation. So what have we learned tonight? To fully participate is what? Yielding our left-sided matrix, our intellect, our reason, our logic, our emotions, our feelings, yielding it to the Christ mind and allow the Christ mind then to control all of those things within us as we participate and as we know his truth. And so, folks, that's where we're at. Want to see changes out here? Apparent changes? Want to see changes that aren't really changes but appear to be changes? we got to see the whole earth full of the glory of God. So in closing, God can't, but you can. God can't, but you can. God cannot sovereignly control people's lives. You know, and we're going to teach a lesson on predestination. And some people believe today that God is so sovereign that no matter what you do, it's so, your blueprint is so fixed in cement That no matter what you do, if he's decided for you to have a good life, you're going to have a good life, no matter what you do or say. If he's decided you're going to have a horrible life, you're going to have a horrible life. God, yes, that's sad. God is love. And read 1 Corinthians 13 in the Amplified. Love is uncontrolling. Love does not coerce. Love inspires. Love directs from within. But listen, there are things that God cannot do and things he does not know about us. Aren't you glad? I'm happy about that. In fact, I'm joyous about that. Right? I feel that in my feeler tonight. So, Father, we thank you for your truth, your word. Thank you for this people. Thank you, Father, how you have, by your spirit within us, taught us and trained us and quickened your word and conceived your word within us. And we will be a people that will fully participate with every fiber of our being. We thank you tonight. We bless you for the revelation. We thank you for your love, your grace. And we thank you that through Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we can once again see who we are and see that it is all finished and it is all done. In the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.